day today. What a gorgeous little reprieve we've had this last couple days of uh, beautiful weather. We know that uh, God is good in all things, but it's so nice when he gives us a little uh, blessing of uh, some beautiful weather here in July. And so it's so good to see each of you as we get ready to start this morning, as people are making their way in. It's one of those uh, beautiful, lazy summer Sundays that we're here to worship the Lord. And we're here to do really the work of the Lord this morning and be a part of that as a family. So would you just uh, welcome the, the Lord here this morning? We know that we carry Him in our hearts, but it's so good to also do it corporately. So would you stand with me this morning? We're going to just pray and uh, begin. Father God, we thank you so much for this day that you've made. God, we rejoice and we are glad in it. God, we thank you for the gifts that you give us, the blessings, the prosperity, the joy, the excitement, the, uh, the, the, the looking forward to the life that you have brought to us through your son Jesus, the destiny that we have in him. And so, God, this morning we not only pray and thank you for us who've gathered, but, God, we pray for the churches, the body of Christ throughout this community, throughout this valley. We ask that, God, today they would be blessed as well as, Lord, your people uh, are doing the work of the ministry, as we are kingdom-minded. God, let, let, let it be a prosperous morning all throughout the valley. God, we pray for those that come into the body of Christ. They come into church uh, that, that don't know you as Lord and Savior all throughout this valley as they make their way this morning, as, as you bring them into your presence. We got, God, we pray that, that today they would see the love that you have for them, the, the, the plans that you make. We've been talking the last two weeks, Lord, you know your word in Jeremiah 29, 11 that tells us that you have thoughts towards us, thoughts of good, to bring us to an expected end. And so, God, we pray that, that people would begin to understand that you have a destiny for them as well. You have plans for them. You've, you've set out and mapped out strategies for them. And God, I pray this morning that those that are downhearted and hurting and, and uh, really at the rope's end, and God, they would realize that you've given a rope of hope and that, God, you are willing and ready, Lord God. And so that's our prayer this morning for those that don't know you. God, for those of us who know you, we ask that, Lord, you would continue to strengthen us, encourage us. Let us uh, just be that joyful noise in this community, in this state, in this nation. This, this joyful noise that rings out in the midst of all the things that are happening, that you are on the throne, and that, God, you are in control, and that, Father God, that you have plans concerning this nation. And, God, we look to you this morning. Our gaze and our, our, our praise is upon you because you are the God that changes. You change the atmosphere. You change our attitudes. You change our hearts. God, you are the God that heals and you heal, Father, Lord Jesus, the wounded. You heal the broken. God, you heal the hurting minds. God, you bring peace. And so, God, today we get to come before the creator of all, the Lord of all, and worship. And we give you thanks and praise for that in your name. Amen. Amen. Would you greet a couple people around you? Maybe a handshake or a, a hug and let them know that you're glad that they're here this morning. And uh, we're going to get ready to worship the Lord today. We welcome you and pray that you're encouraged this morning and blessed. our God, every word of worship in one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God, sing hallelujah to our 
our God. Glory, hallelujah, is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, sing it out. Every praise is to our God. Every word in one accord. Every praise, every praise. Every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Hallelujah, it's to our God. Every praise, every praise, every praise, it's to our God. Let's praise Him this morning. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise, is to our God. In one accord, every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our glory, hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God.
Let your presence fill this place. Let heaven come. Let your angels be released. Let heaven come. We will worship at your feet. Let heaven come. Face to face we want to For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul, for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me.
Just let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do right now in you. Such a presence of the Lord here right now. Last week we said about, sang about, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Today we're asking him, burn like a fire in me. Burn like a fire in me. What does that mean? What does that, what does that, what's that mean? Well, for one thing, it's going to bring some excitement to the situation. Yeah? I don't know if you want a one alarm, two alarm, three alarm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whoa! What do you want? What can you contain? Is there enough room for the fire of God to burst forth in us? God has so much that he wants to do through his people because we're living in peerless times you got to look that word up some of you young ones it means really bad really really bad but here we are here we are with the fire of God with the light with the salt with the power with the influence to change atmospheres and create the goodness of the Lord the goodness of the Lord the hope that springs forth eternal the good news I feel like the presence of the Lord right now Pastor Lance we're just set up for prayer. We're just set up for prayer right now. It, the Word of God says when we humble ourselves, we bow ourselves before God. He's going to heal our land, our land. We know that we're in times that the Word of God says, don't, don't think of this as something that you can't even imagine happening because this is what's going to happen. But God says, I got a people, I got a remnant of people that are going to pray in Jesus' name. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. No, a couple things. Um, Pastor was, uh, you know, Pastor Roger, he's on vacation. He's uh, up in Dunsmere relaxing and enjoying that. He got a call concerning uh, the events of this week by our local law enforcement, uh, you know, a, 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 as if we weren't going to pray. But here's the deal. Here's the understanding of what's happening. Is you go to the authority that you need when you need help. And the police department themselves and the sheriffs, they called on our churches to pray for our community, to pray for our nation. Like I said, as if we weren't going to. <laughs> But I want you to let you know where the petition, where the request is coming from. I want to let you know as we begin to pray. We're going to pray for a few things for our nation and then kind of even bring it right down to, to our locality. But I want to tell you how much everyone means to our God. There is, there is a, he's not, right, right before my mom started to bring this up, there was this sense of this feeling of, that sometimes we're reactionary, but you have to understand and realize that God is not reactionary. Do you understand that? He is not reactionary. He is the creator. He created all things. 
He has it all set up. He is not reactionary. Right now, he understands the hurts of individuals. He understands fears. He understands all of that. And he has elements set up, whether it's men and women of God, churches, the body of Christ, ministries, the Word of God in front of people, the spirit of our prayer and the prayers that go forth from, from others. He has the system set up. He's, he's, God is good here. He wants us to come alongside Him this morning. He wants us to agree with Him concerning what He has already set in motion, His plans. His plans. I want to tell you how much He loves everybody, every person. Probably the most famous verse in all of the Word of God tells us how much He loves everybody, how much He loves every person, how much everyone matters to Him. He said, I so love the world that I gave my only son. He gave. And that's what we begin to do. We give. We don't demand, but we give. The spirit that's within us, this fire, this light that's in us. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe would have everlasting life and would not perish. That's our God. That's His plan. That's His reservoir. That is what He has available. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. And if you want to grab the hand of somebody next to you, if you want to kind of pray along with this. But we're going to pray over a few things over our nation. The first thing we're going to pray right now this morning is for the spirit of love. This true spirit of love. The love of God that he is in no short supply of. Would you do that this morning? Father God, we pray right now. Just pray along with me. You don't have to listen to my prayer. You can pray along, but you can just uh, be in agreement too if you need to. But God, we pray right now that the genuine love that you have given this world through your son, Jesus Christ, through the example of of him, through the church, through, through everything that we stand for, God, would you shake us that we would be an example of your genuine love? God, we pray the love. That, that invades, the love that comes, the love that comforts, the love, Lord God, that brings a, 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 a safety, Lord God, the love that when you look into someone's eyes, you know that you know that you know that they care. That God, we pray that this become evident right now in this nation. We pray that you release the spirit of the love of God, the love of Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit in the United States of America. God, we pray that it is released in the regions right now that need it the most. We pray that your church is filled up with the love of Almighty God to release and to give. And God, we thank you, God, that love, love conquers all. It covers a multitude of sins this morning, Lord God. Love covers a multitude of errors this morning, God. Love keeps no records of wrong this morning, God. We know that. That's what your word says. You understand this. This morning, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love covers a multitude of sins. Father God, cover the sins of our nation with your love. Cover the wrongs of people in our nations with your love. Cover us with your love. Cover us with your love. Father God, we want to pray for the spirit of peace that calms all fears. We want to pray, Lord God, for the peace that passes the understandings that we may know or have grown up with. We pray that a peace would begin to calm a nation, calm a region. That God, peace would be able to calm, Father God, areas. That it would be able to come on the scene, on the spot. That your peace, Lord God, your richness of peace would would pervade us. That God, there would be a calmness about this nation that peace would begin to reign, that peace would begin to be let out, Lord God. God, you have the supply of this. It does not run shallow. We cannot use it up. Father God, we pray that it would be expended and spent over the United States of America right now, that God, you would bring your peace. God, we pray for for those, Lord God, that are are, uh, uh, in areas of of life or areas of, of maybe even errors that they've made, that they would walk in peace, that they would not walk in fear. They would know that there is forgiveness and redemption and salvation in you, Jesus. God, we pray for those, Lord God, who've been called to protect and serve, that they would operate in peace. That, Father God, there would not be fear in their lives. That, God, they would not react, Lord God, to the agent of this world, the enemy, who would want to cause them to be in fear, 
cause them to react out of a fear base. But God, we ask that they would be covered with peace. God, they are called peace officers. God, we pray your peace would be poured out upon them. The peace that passes all knowledge and understanding. Everything that's being talked over and talked about, and nothing's wrong with talking. Nothing is wrong with talking things over and, and talking them out. But God, above all confusion and all thoughts, Lord, your peace, let it override. Let it overlay. Let it be like that big soft comforter, that big blanket, Lord God, that covers us. We thank you, Jesus. God, we ask right now, in, in particular, in practical Father, Lord Jesus, a, a protection, a protection right now, Lord, over this nation, over the streets of this, this nation. We ask, Lord God, for a protection, that there would be a, 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 a spiritual guard that would cause a, a even crime to be a, a just a, a controlled, that, Lord God, the, that criminal minds cannot even plan things right now. That there would be a protection over our nation to cause a, 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 a slowing down of, of this motor that's running. That, Father, Lord Jesus, we just ask you that, Lord, you would not only protect those who protect and serve, but, God, that you would begin to, to come in and, and, and disarm those that would want to hurt. And God, we ask for that protection over law enforcement, over military. We ask for your protection, Lord God, over those who are in authority over those who make decisions and choices that, Father, Lord God, could be, could be used as an example. We say protection, God, by your spirit, Lord, that you would cover this nation right now. You would cover the regions of this nation right now. God, we ask you, Lord Jesus, for healing, physical, practical healing for those who have been injured, that, Lord God, that they would be able to recover, that they would be able to take their place and, and, and operate in forgiveness and operate in, in, in the destiny that they've been called. And God, we ask you for healing. God, we ask you for physical healings, that you would touch lives, that, Lord God, none, no more would be lost. God, we ask you, Father, Lord God, for healings of hearts right now, healing of, of minds, Lord, those that are hurt, those that have legitimate reasons to be hurt, those who have been living with, with, with thoughts and, 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 and uh, just years and years, Father Lord God, of, of teaching and training, and that, Father Lord God, the hurts are being, uh, as they feel justified, or their hurts are being uh, uh, opened up, but God, we ask and we say that, Lord God, there, there is no justice outside of your justice, and that, God, you are the just one, and God, you've come to heal. You've come to heal hurts, not just expose them, but you've come to heal them. You've come to bring healing, and so, Father God, we begin that you would, we pray that you would begin to heal exposed hurts, God. Heal them through, through forgiveness, God. Heal them, Father God, through love and compassion, what we've been praying about. We thank you, God, for that. God, we ask you for, for this city. God, months ago, we started to prepare our, our community, prepare the people of Madeira to support those who protect and serve this community. And God, we, we're not all knowing, we're not all knowledgeable. We don't know if we have perfection here in Madeira. We probably don't. We probably don't. But Father God, I thank you for a spirit of love, a spirit of honor. And God, we pray that that would continue right now in Madeira. We pray over our police officers, our police chief, the administration, the authority there in downtown. God, we pray for their everyday operation, that Father God, that they, although are cognizant of what's happening worldwide, that Father God, they would continue to, to, to have a mindset of that peace that we prayed for, and that this city, Lord God, is this community, Father Lord, is supportive of them. God, we thank you for our sheriffs and their, their work in the outlying county, and as they patrol these, these uh, uh, this, the county lines for our highway patrolmen up and down our, our freeways, God, as they they, they could keep us safe, God. They, they keep us, Father Lord God, from, from those that would want to do harm. They uncover things that happened before they happen. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for those that you've placed in the right positions. For our sheriff, our, our, our chief sheriff, for his wisdom. God, we pray right now 
And as we get back on Monday morning, tomorrow morning, and even throughout tonight, and as we move into a new week, that, God, there would be a covering on the streets of Madeira. God, we pray for Fresno. It's a, it's a big city right next to us. God, we thank you. This, just this May, we heard from Chief Dyer as he spoke at our marriage prayer breakfast. We pray for wisdom. We have officers in this very congregation that serve both the, in, in Madeira and in Fresno. And, God, we ask you, Lord God, for Fresno. We pray, Father God, that there would be a, 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 a gel of the Holy Spirit that would be just saturating that community. That, God, there would be nothing that would rise up. But, God, there would be love that would be poured out to their uh, officers and their officials. That, God, they would see the same spirit of unity that we're seeing in Madeira. God, we pray that big city to our south, our big brother to the south, that, God, it would be a calm and a beautiful community right now. We ask you for that. We thank you for that. God, we thank you that, God, in these moments and these times that we are not paralyzed, that we don't throw up our hands and say we don't know what to do. We thank you that we have a God who is in control of everything, that you are completely in control. And, God, we ask you that you would keep us sensitive to your Holy Spirit, that we would move in prayer and we would move in action with what you do, with what you're doing. We want to be in concert. We want to be in unity with what you're doing. We thank you, God, for that. We thank you, Jesus, for that. We're going to sing this little part just right now. Oh, that's new. We're going to sing this part right now of the song we just sang a little bit. I just want you to declare it. Let heaven come. You can be seated. Let those angels be released over this nation. Let it be released over this community. Come on, just declare it as a part of your prayer. Go ahead and let's sing that part. Let your angels be released. Let heaven come. Let your prayer fill this place Let those two lines just keep saying that your angels be released Let your angels be released let heaven come let your presence fill this place when we say this place I want you to think big let your angels be released let heaven Think of the place, this nation, this state. Let your presence fill this place. Let heaven come. Let your angels be released. Let heaven come. Let your presence fill this place. Let heaven come. Let your angels be As we started this morning, we said every praise be to our God. And I want to finish this worship this morning exalting Him. Not the fears, not the thoughts, but the one who's in control. Amen. Let's just sing this little chorus. It says, I exalt Thee. Let's sing. I exalt Lift 
him up. He's worthy this morning. I exalt thee. Oh, we lift you up, Lord. I exalt thee. There is none like you. I exalt thee. Oh, Lord. Let's sing the verse. For thou art in the front, bowls in the back. We want you to be participatory with it. And God, we thank you for the provision that you've blessed us with. God, we thank you for the gifts, the talents, the timing, prosperity with health and, 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 and gifts and talents and as well as the finances that you bring. God, this morning we bring, Lord, back into our trust, the thing we put our trust into, you. We bring, Father God, just a portion of that. As we come back and we say, Father God, that we believe in what you're doing. We believe in the spirit that's alive in this age of Jesus Christ moving and reigning through the Holy Spirit. And so, Father God, take this and do work. Do work in this community and do work beyond. And, God, we give you praise and glory. And we ask that all that remains, Lord God, that, God, we would be a joyful giver as we give out. Lord, joyful at the gas pumps, joyful at the grocery market, joyful as we give to those in our family and even our friends who are in need. God, we thank you for supplying us, and we give you praise and glory. In your name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you bring forth your tithes, your offerings.
we do a lot of incredible things here in this in this house but one of them is whenever we get to dedicate a child to the Lord when when Hannah was was praying to the Lord for for a child she made a declaration in her prayer that if I were to have a child I will dedicate it to you Lord and then the Lord blessed her with the son and then we see in, in, in Luke in chapter 2, verse 22, Joseph and Mary take Jesus into the synagogue. And there they dedicate. Can you believe it? You get, they dedicated the Son of God to God. <laughs> this morning I have, I have the honor of joining with uh, two very special people in my life, Sammy and Jordan Murphy as this morning we're going to dedicate little Austin Lynn to the Lord. So I'm going to invite uh, Sammy and Jordan and, and, and their family to join me on stage. I'm, so, I'm going to stay up here. It's better on the camera. Come on. You guys are, you guys are better. It's better on the camera. Jordan, help out, help out people. Help out people. Come on down. Come on down. We can move. I can move. I can move. Yeah. Come on. Come on up, family. Yeah, don't be shy. Don't be shy. This is not a shy family. Today is not the day. I, um, Sammy, Sammy is, is very special to me. She, she grew up in my youth group and, uh, and I love her like a daughter. I mean, this girl should be preaching. And hopefully someday you'll get to hear her do that. But a couple of years ago, uh, she met a guy from Laverne. I went to Occidental, so we're, we're rivals in college. But we're friends in life. And, and when, when I found out that, that Sammy and Jordan were getting married, I was thrilled. And then they asked me to do the wedding, and I was even more thrilled because I knew it was going to be a great party. And I've, I've just been able to do life with, with all of them. And, and, and I, I love this family. And so when I, when I heard that they were dedicating little Austin, I, I kind of wanted to jump at it because Austin's special to me too. It was about 6 a.m. in the morning, somewhere between 6 and 7, and my wife and I were anxiously waiting for a call and a text on March 3rd of this year from the Murphys because we knew Sammy had gone into labor on the 2nd and we were laughing because she had all these beautiful pictures of her in the hospital like smiling and like here we go it's baby time I'm like mm -hmm. yeah uh huh you ain't gonna be smiling much longer how many hours of labor 20 21 hours of labor she's still beautiful though right look at this it's still gorgeous and we got a text saying, Austin's here, mom's happy, baby's healthy, everyone's good. And what we loved about it was because we knew two hours from, from that text, Clarissa would actually give birth to our second son, Chasen. So they share the same birthday. Uh, that's pretty special. I think that's really cool. I think that's awesome. This morning, I want to read a couple of scriptures to you guys in Deuteronomy in chapter 6. The Bible says this, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. That's the responsibility that you two take over Austin to teach and to train to equip her with the word of God, to equip her with the opportunity to encounter Jesus so that at some point she makes a decision to follow Jesus with all of her heart, with all of her life. We also play a role in this, but not as much as you do, as family, to hold Sammy and Jordan accountable for the decision that they, they're making today, that they want to raise their daughter in the house of the Lord. The Bible says in, in Proverbs 17, 6, it says that grandchildren are the crowned, are the crowns that are worn by the aged ones. 
This is your crown, Anthony. This is your crown, Sam. I mean, it's incredible to me how children become rewards of the Lord in our lives. I fully believe that Austin's heart is the tablet that the two of you will write love letters to each other on. Psalms chapter 27 verse 3 reminds us how children are a reward from the Lord. And I was kind of thinking, you know, what would the Lord say of Austin this morning? What's, what's the prophetic word in Austin's life? And it's a simple word called joy. I believe that the Lord operates through Austin with an amount of joy that hasn't been seen in a little girl in a long time. I believe that she single-handedly, so the, the letter that was written by Paul to Philemon, he said this to Philemon, he says that you, you have this love that has given great joy and encouragement to the body of Christ. And for that, I am thankful of you, Philemon. I believe that's her. I believe she has a joy and an encouragement. I believe that when your family sees her, encounters her, there's a joy and an excitement that comes, not because she's a baby, but because of what she carries from heaven. I believe the same thing, that when Jordan comes home, that there is a, a renewal of energy that comes whenever he holds her, whenever he embraces her. That's her operating in the gift of joy that she's been given, to encourage, to equip. I believe that the Lord says of Austin that she's strong, that she's a woman who is going to be capable of making strong decisions, honest and based in truth that you two are going to raise her in. I want to pray over Austin this morning, and I'm not brave enough to try and hold her because she's looking good. She's feeling good. This is happy. This is what I'm going to ask of the body. Now, I've never done a baby dedication unless they were my blood. This is the first. I'm gonna ask the body, if you agree to pray and join in, in Sammy and Jordan's lives, and build community, if you, if you wanna agree that we're gonna raise this child together as a church, as a family, joining the Murphy and the Diaz family, would you just stand this morning? If, that, if you wanna make that agreement, you don't have to. There's no gun put to your head. But Sammy's looking around, so you know, this is... And let's just pray for little Austin Lynn. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray. And we dedicate Austin Lynn to you. Father, we thank you for this family that has chosen to raise their daughter in the ways of the Lord. Father, I pray that this morning her heart would be captivated by you. That you would remind her nightly, daily, that you love her. That Austin would feel your spirit. That Austin would know that you are real, Jesus and that soon she would choose to follow you with all of her life. Father, I pray that the gifts of the Spirit would come forth in this young girl's life, that she would be a mighty warrior, that she would seek the place of prayer, that she would look for intimacy with you, and that, Jesus, that you would begin to prepare the way of life that you have paved out for her, that she would make choices, God, that are choices made in the Word and that are based on truth. Father, that she would stand for what is holy and righteous, that she would be a woman of justice. And I thank you for the gift of joy that you have bestowed upon her, that she would be an encourager, that she would be life wherever she goes, and that she would exemplify Jesus Christ. I pray for Sammy and Jordan that you would give them strength, that you would give them more men and women that would surround them to encourage them as they parent and as they choose to raise their children in the word of God. Father, the earth around us, it wars against the, the things that are holy. But Father, I thank you that you are equipping this family for such a time as this. I pray that Jordan would continue to be the head of his household, that he would make decisions that a man makes for his family, that he would, God, turn to the word, that he would look for wisdom from the aged ones who are in his family, and that he would love these girls with all of his heart. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Come on.
Praise God. Bless you guys. Thank you guys for leading us and being with us in worship this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. You know, this morning, uh, I want to share a couple things with you real quick before Pastor Charles comes back up to minister. Once again, this uh, month is our month of, of just kind of uh, uh, really relaxing a little bit as a church leadership. We, we pour so much in from August to June with, with planning and, and, and different uh, uh, events and things like that. And so uh, there is no Wednesday nights in, in July. We'll start back up on August the 10th as well as uh, a, a few of the other things that we, we typically do in the month, uh, our prayer on Tuesday mornings and uh, a few other things. So we thank you for your, your patience allowing us to rest. But there are some, some neat opportunities. You know, last week I talked about uh, uh, the, the, what happens in our lives when, when God has plans for us and we receive those plans and then all of a sudden we have to start to adjust our plans to what he wants to do because God wants to do things in your lives. And it was really neat because right after uh, the message yesterday or last Sunday, I had a, a young lady come up to me and talk to me about her heart for missions. And uh, in that, it's funny that, uh, you know, this morning there's going to be two people talking about missions and uh, the possibility of you being involved both locally and very, very far away in a country maybe some of you have never even heard of. But first of all, Shane, uh, congratulations. Is the baby in the house? Goodness gracious, this baby was born, what, four days ago? And uh, Evangelina, uh, Sophia, Anna, Anne? Yeah, Evangelina, Sophia, and Lehman. Congratulations to you, Naomi. Congratulations, Shane and Liliana, big sister. And uh, you guys are looking great back there. Shane, um, why don't you stand real quick just so I can um, show people who you are. This is Shane Lehman. He uh, has done some teaching for us on the prophetic and, and uh, ministry and prayer and the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, he did some Wednesday night classes. And he took that Wednesday night class into a calling. He has a calling on his heart for missions. Uh, him and his wife soon will be going uh, as the Lord leads him and calls him into Mexico. And uh, language school and uh, devoting some time and missions there and short-term, long-term missions. But in the meantime, he's all, you know what, God's going to use me right now too in missions. And so uh, God has called him to develop a, a team to go to the swap meet once a month. And they, they, they did it last month, and they began to pray for people, and they ministered to people, and uh, saw God heal people, bring salvation to their lives. And if you think that you may, and especially if you're bilingual, you may have the capacity to share the love of Christ through not just uh, uh, maybe your testimony, but uh, uh, praying, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, praying salvation, but praying for healing, praying for the needs that people come with to be met and let them see God arrive on their scene in their situation. Uh, Shane is going to be having a meeting on Thursday evening. Thursday evening uh, right here? Somewhere. But what he wants to do is he wants to meet with you. He's got a sign-up list on the back of the table back there. He's going to be there this uh, morning at the end of the service. He'd love to talk with you, let you know kind of what, what, what God's doing. He's putting it all together with, with a tent and with music and, and all kinds of things. So, Shane, we love you and I love your family. And uh, what a blessing you guys are to this community, Madeira. And now you got a new blessing. So, uh, <laughs> hey, were you all smiles before labor, Naomi? Were you taking uh, selfies? No. It was so much easier, though, this time, right? That's what Shane said. It was like a piece of cake. <laughs> Shane thought it was easier. Just Shane. Uh, Carl, come on up real quick. Uh, Carl Alamania uh, is, is a, a longtime member and leader within the uh, Fellowship of uh, business, Christian Businessmen. But, but this is not really a Fellowship of Christian Businessmen opportunity. He is desiring to uh, take a group of people into Manamar. Myanmar. I knew I would get it wrong, but I would try really hard. I'm sure some people say it like I say it all the time, right? But Myanmar, which is in Southeast Asia, Burma, Burma around Burma, old Burma. And uh, this is for 2017, summer of 2017. So you are inviting people to come out. Uh, let them know when and a little bit about uh, what your heart is in. in uh, I know in our bulletin next month we'll have the date and time. So. Thank you very much. You know, uh, spring is the beginning of things, and it's exciting. And this spring, Myanmar, the old Burma, this spring is the first time that they had civilian uh, elections. They had been under military rule for over 60 years. And I am an agricultural missionary. My 
my heart is to help the poor. Uh, there is just no reason why people should go hungry. There's just no reason. And so a, a simple thing like how to grow vegetables, how to grow better rice, how to raise better hogs, goats, chickens, just a simple thing like that. Uh, we are in seven countries in Africa, and we take street kids and train them for leadership. And I said, Lord, it, it's time we do something else for Myanmar. And the Lord actually, I, some of you were here. Uh, I actually spoke to you uh, when I went to Myanmar. It was three years ago I went to Myanmar. And lo and behold, I, I don't want to prolong it because I'm excited to hear Pastor Charles. Um, the uh, underground church, Myanmar is less than 2% Christians, less than 2%. It's mostly Buddhist, Hindi, and Muslim. One state of the 14 states is a Christian state. It's Chin State. That's the northwest uh, part of the country adjacent to Bangladesh. That's the Christian state. And the Christians there, uh, they do their very best, and they train. Uh, they're wishing for Bibles. There's no Bible. And then those that are called, like pastor just challenged us this morning, they go to different countries, states, different states, and they share Christ. In the old days, you get put in jail. Three years ago in May, uh, you were allowed, the government allowed you to talk one-on-one -on -one about your faith. One-on-one. -on -one. If you go beyond that, you're in jail. Okay. Well, this spring, they allowed people to talk about their faith. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Well, the, God, God knows when to do things. And, and, and uh, lo and behold, I've been so excited. I've been trying to work with, with, our, with our missionary and, and our group in India. They want me to drill a well for them. And there is, there's a priest, he's here now, Father Julian uh, Palacity. He's in the same province as Julie. And he's asking me to come and help him with the rice production. And, uh, and he got my name off the Internet, you know, because we used, Annie and I, we've been doing this since 1976, helping people. We, we started Africa in 1984. We are now in seven countries. And... Uh, We've got leaders out of those young people that are in legislature, street kids that became, uh, that became politicians like this one. <laughs> Hallelujah. But so things are happening, opportunities here, and Pastor is going to put it in the bulletin, but I, I, I'm stepping out in faith that the Lord will give me 30 to 50 people team. I already have a dental team that's coming. We're going to have a medical team from Texas that's going to come. Okay. So that's probably going to be about 10 to a dozen people right there. Uh, one of our local dentists is going to go with me. And he's all set, ready to go. And, but I need a construction team. We're going to build a kitchen for this orphanage. I don't want to talk about the orphanage, but there's a thing about orphanages in Myanmar. It has something to do with the church, the underground church, okay? So, so uh, maybe you want to serve children, and maybe you want to be a dorm mommy. Maybe you want to be a cook, okay? I can put you, because the, the person that the Lord put me in front with in Myanmar is the leader of the underground church. He has 600 pastors that he's working with, I'm, I'm trying to mentor a dozen of them right now, okay? And so there's a lot of work to be done, brand new, brand new space. And God is allowing us as a body of Christ to come, to come together. So I need builders. One of our board members is a contractor in Oakhurst, and uh, he's, he goes, oh, Carl, we can do that kitchen that you want. And with, with just five people, 
Ah, uh, duh. <laughs> Not me. The right five people. <laughs> right five people. What, so, what date is the date that you're going to be in August? In my house, in the backyard, uh, I have a pretty big backyard. I want, if you're interested, if you want to be a prayer partner, a uh, 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 resource partner, or just to go and find out what's going on, maybe you know somebody that wants to go in missions, um, September, I mean, August 21st, third Sunday, 4 o'clock, okay, we'll, we'll have some tri-tips, and we'll have a meeting, ask me questions, lo and behold, this is the other plus, the, yesterday, I went down to Southern Cal, but yesterday I got word uh, from Myanmar, the leader of the underground church, he says, my visa came through, I'm coming to the United States. So Annie and I are hosting him uh, here in Madeira. So I, I made an announcement to Pastor Lance. So things are happening. So he'll be here also to answer some of your questions on August 21st. Okay? So exciting, exciting. Thank you, Carl. Contact me. He'll get you the phone number at the office. Uh, I need RSVP, text, whatever, because I don't answer phones. Cause I get so many phone calls from all over the world. And some of them are commercials. <laughs> so you got to leave me a text. Carl, I could come. I'll have five people with me for the, for the uh, Sunday afternoon uh, meeting. So I can have a head count. If it gets too big, I'll work with a pastor that will do it here somewhere in the church. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much, Carl. So if you, um, your heart is stirred for overseas missions, uh, August 21st, note that down, Sunday evening, uh, 4 o'clock, and we'll have it in our bulletin for August. It's going to be awesome. Looking forward to that. I uh, want to thank you so much for your guys' support of the fireworks and uh, the booth. And Charles, uh, uh, I know, is excited. They, they raised over $8,000 for uh, youth ministry, and a big portion of that's going to be put right into work uh, in about two weekends with the I Am Influence uh, conference coming, and I don't know if you're going to share any about that, but it is in the bulletin. We'll be sharing a little bit more uh, this next couple weeks, but young people, come out tonight, 630, uh, our generation's uh, youth ministry, and find out more of how uh, your young people, your junior high, high schoolers can get involved with I Am Influence conference coming up in just two weekends, and uh, adults, we want to come out and support as well. It's going to be a good weekend, but start to get your kids sign up. Was it $35? $35? $35 for uh, the Friday, Saturday, and then uh, Melissa House staying over on Sunday to do worship. Uh, let's give Charles a big hand and uh, bless him as he comes up to minister. Love you, brother. Good job in the fireworks booth last week, man. You, uh, you sold a bunch of fireworks and you blew up a few things and all your fingers are still here and you're ready to go and you got your book. Awesome. Come on. Yeah, so uh, I Am Influence is happening in a couple of weekends. Sean Smith's going to be coming back to minister uh, along with his wife, Krista. Uh, they are awesome. And I think you guys are really going to be blessed by their ministry as well as uh, Melissa Howe is going to be leading worship. She led worship at the women's retreat uh, this, this past winter. And so uh, she's okay. She's all right. Uh, but we're excited to have her back. And uh, it's just going to be a great time. I am... Um, It's wild. I saw, I see my friend Donald in the crowd, but uh, what's crazy is for the last two weeks, I've been mayor of Madeira because Robert decided to go on vacation. He deserves vacation. He works really hard, but that leaves me in charge. That's not good. That's not good. It's been fun, though. It, it's been, it's been a, 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 it's been a good experience for me. I, um, a lot happened this week, and my heart, my heart just, I'm just, I'm just in an achy place. I'm in a real achy place, and um, I just, I, I want, I want our nation to see the church respond. I, I want our nation to see the church rise up. I want our nation to see the church not just hashtag, y'all following me? I don't, I don't want our nation to see the church just hashtag. It's bigger than a hashtag. I want to see the church of the United States of America respond to, to everything that's taken place in, in, in Dallas, 
in, in, in Minnesota, in Louisiana, and, and, and within the African American community as well. The best way I could explain it was, you know, a lot of people take the concept of Black Lives Matter in, in a different direction. And I, I just want to kind of touch on this because my heart's all over the place. Obviously, all lives matter. Obviously. If my house was on fire, every house on my block matters. But there's only one house that's burning that needs help. Every house matters, but there's one house that really needs attention right now. I, I am, I'm reading, I was reading in Second Chronicles, and Jehoshaphat is, is faced with this military, this army. And everybody comes to Jehoshaphat, and they're like, what do we do? What do we do? And he had no answer. Family, I said, I don't have an answer. I don't have any answers. So Jehoshaphat went to the Lord and began to petition and said exactly that. Lord, we have no answers. You have the answer. You, you have the answer. And I believe that as a church, we have the opportunity to seek the Lord the way Jehoshaphat did and say, listen, we just don't have the answer. But I know there's, there's people that are hurting. That there are mothers and fathers that are mourning this morning. I got to hold my sons this morning. There's children that aren't going to be able to be held ever again. And, and, and we have, we may not have any answers, tangible answers. Like if we would just do A, B, C, and D, it would all get fixed. And so I just, I just go into that place of prayer. And I want to encourage all of you to seek and pray. Because the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He's got one agenda. One agenda. That's it. But then the Bible also says that if my people will call upon my name, he never says you have to fix it. He says, you've got to call upon my name, though, because I'm big enough to handle whatever, just like what Pastor Lance said. So I want to encourage you that as you see a, a, a people group, we've, we've, got, we've got to listen. We, we've, we've, we do have to dialogue. We do have to pay attention. But I'm, I'm choosing to fast and pray. That's what I'm choosing to do. That is my, that is my personal, that is, <laughs> as the mayor of Madeira, I can say that today. I'm choosing to fast and pray. Because we're better than this, America. We're, we're just, we're better than this. We, we know enough now to make better decisions. We know enough now and, and we just, our nation needs leadership. And not from a platform, per se, from a president. We, we just, we need leadership in our, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. That, that's where we need the leadership. You have the opportunity today to make a difference. Learn your neighbors. Learn your families. Go home. What was decided today by, by a husband and a wife to train their child the way that that child should go, that's, that's where it begins. Because what we're experiencing is we're experiencing generations of fatherless and motherless children that are crying out for a father and for a mother and for answers that they have all these questions to. And the church has to respond. 
call it what you want, it's H2O, but ultimately we were mothering and fathering over 100 kids from our neighborhood. We're, we're just, we're in that place of history where we're either going to look back as a church and say, yes, yes, or we're going to look back and go, oh my gosh, we missed it again. I, I just, we can't. We can't keep missing it, church, and then, and then saying, well, we missed it again. Well, we missed it again. I believe leaders are rising up. I believe the Lord is going to be exalted through all of this. And I firmly believe that hope is alive in a nation today. I believe hope is alive. You can still be grieved. You can still mourn and, and you can still process hurt. But you can also still have hope. And that's kind of what I want to talk about this morning. Two years ago, I lost my mom. My world just blew up. Boom. And I'm still trying to figure all that out. <laughs> but hope's alive in my life. God is still bigger. I don't sit in my room and ask why, God, why? Why me? Why us? Why now? I say, okay, Jesus, purpose has to come of this. I kind of want to talk about community today. Martin Luther King had written a letter while he was in jail that said that old, the old law of an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. It's immoral because it seeks to humiliate the opponent rather than win his understanding. It destroys community and makes brotherhood impossible. I believe that community is what the Lord is looking the church to begin to build. For so long, the church has been building buildings. I think it's time that the church begins to build people again. More importantly, I also feel like the modern church has become a place where you get to come plug yourself in, and then unplug when you're charged. Every time I travel with teenagers, there's one thing they need, an outlet. Where can I plug in my phone? We'll go to a fast food restaurant. Place is completely empty, but all 20 of the kids that I'm traveling with are hovered around one table, and they've got extension cords coming out of the outlet. They're all just trying to plug in their cell phones. And sometimes that's kind of how the church responds to community. The, the body wants the church, the pastors, to build the community for you so you can walk in through these doors, plug yourself in, and then when it's time to leave, you leave. And then you wait another five weeks, six weeks when you need community, and you hope that Pastor Dixie and Pastor Roger and Pastor Lance and Pastor Barbara have built enough community for you so you can come right in, plug right in, and then go and plug yourself out. Well, I hope Woven has it all together for me because I'm going to show up and I need to plug myself in. And if Woven doesn't have it all together, then you don't come back. It's like a restaurant. We begin to treat church like it's a restaurant, you know. I go to restaurants for one reason. Food's good. Right? Right? Now, some of you have other reasons why you keep going back to a restaurant. How many of you would say service is important if you're going to a restaurant? Just two people. Okay, just three people. My wife was a server for years. And we'll go to restaurants, and the first thing she does is she starts tearing apart our server. I'm like, baby, the food's good. Just, just handle it but if the service isn't good 
then you're probably not going to go back to the restaurant. You're not going to go up to the server and begin to explain and, hey, listen, you know, it would be so much better if you did this or this. Or, hey, how can I help you? You're not going to go into the back of the kitchen and say, hey, listen, the way you prepared those vegetables, what if we tried this and did this? No. You're just not going to go back. And more importantly, you're going to tell other people when they say, "Woo, that restaurant, you're going to be like, oh, no, 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 not that restaurant. Oh, no, you, you got it all twisted. I don't know where it happened, but somehow church became a restaurant for many people. They liked what was on the menu, and then all of a sudden the menu changed, and you go, whoa! The menu changed. Can I still order it this way? If you ever go to eat with Lance Leach, you'll, you'll, you'll understand there's the menu that is given to you, and then there's the Lance Leach menu. He takes a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and can you add a half of that? Anyone else order like that? The, what I love about church is that it's the people. That, that's what I love about church. I was always told if you find the perfect church, you need to leave because you're going to mess it up. <laughs> people, are, people are fun. People are messy. People are people. People say things that they shouldn't. People laugh when they shouldn't. People don't respond when they should. People aren't there when you think they should be. People can't read your mind when you wish they could. And then you get mad at them because they can't. And then they remind you, I can't read your mind. And then you say, oh, is that my job to communicate what's going on up here? I want to challenge us today to grow as people. I want to kind of follow up on what Pastor Lance taught on last week. And I hope together we can kind of walk out of here encouraged. Amen. So Jesus had these guys called the disciples. And, and I think that Jesus did as much as he could with them. There was, there was 12 disciples. Is that correct? Sunday school teachers. There were 12 disciples. But can we all agree that there was really only three of them that he really kept close? At least that what we read about. We know that John was pretty tight. We know that Peter was pretty tight, and I know that James was tight because that was his little brother. We know that, you know, Mark kind of observed. I mean, he was in there, but I'm just saying, I, you, I've got a core group of friends, as several of you do too, but I'm talking about those, those three or two. You know what I'm talking about? Those three, those two that really know what's going on. You got your core group of friends, and they know what's going on. But then you got that BFFFFF. I really know what's going on. Jesus did life with these men, and he did it every day. He did it every day. He, he laughed with them. How many of you guys would love to know what made Jesus laugh? He, 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 he just did life with them every day. Now, that would be equivalent to you having to pick 12 people to do life with every day. Better yet, let's do this. 12 men doing life together every day. Paul, that would be equivalent to you starting a men's ministry for the next three years. And every day, you and 12 men are doing life. Every day. No breaks. That's a stinky bedroom. I don't even know too many women that could do life with 12 women every day for a week, let alone three years. Sooner than later, one woman's going to, ah, just like somebody dying. And then they'd have to resurrect her. <laughs> Jesus did life. Ian Bounds said, said this, the training of the 12 was the great, difficult, enduring work of Christ. These men heard Jesus' sermons every day. I would travel early on in my youth ministry, and I took Buddy James with me 
to a lot of, of, of the places we went up and down the West Coast. All, and, and it got to the point where he would always stand in the very back and, and he, would, he would tell my sermon back to me. He would mouth it almost word for word as I'm preaching. He'd be back there mouthing it. Or he'd nudge somebody sitting next to him. Here comes this joke. Ready? Watch. Told you. Buddy knew everything I could talk about. Buddy knew everything that I preached. These 12 men traveled with Jesus. They knew, they knew when Jesus was going to use, you know, here it is. This is where Jesus is going to ask people to drink his blood and eat his body. Here it comes, you know. These 12 men knew Jesus. I don't think they were as impacted by Jesus' incredible sermons as they were his life. You got to admit, they, Jesus didn't have, like, where he walked and then two miles behind him the disciples walked. It wasn't, it wasn't Jesus had the Escalade and then the disciples all crammed into some, like, you go and, and tried to keep up with Jesus in the Escalade. He didn't fly to destinations to preach and then eventually the disciples got there on their donkeys. Jesus did life with these 12 disciples. And I don't think they were as impacted by what he preached as they were impacted by his life. Because he would get up there and he would talk about spending time with the Father every morning as he woke up early. And then sometimes late at night before he went to, the, and the disciples all sat there and go, yeah, dude, he, you know Jesus was up at like three this morning. I know, he's been doing that for the last month. Right? I don't know about you, but when my child is up at three in the morning every night, every morning for a month, that has an effect on me. If you're doing life with somebody and they're up at 3 in the morning seeking the Lord in prayer, eventually that's going to get to you. You're going to ask a question. What you doing at 3 in the morning, Jesus? Scripture shows us that Jesus actually valued relationship. Scripture also shows us how relationship is important from Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. I mentioned earlier in the baby dedication a letter that was written by Paul to this man named Philemon. And Paul wrote several letters. And what I loved about Paul is in all of his letters, he was constantly giving shout outs. Always giving shout outs. Yo, when you see my boy so and so, tell him Paul says what's up. Because I'm in jail. That's what Paul would do. He would write to encourage men and women who were leading churches in cities that he had traveled to, and then on side notes he would say, make sure you say hello to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so -and -so. Relationship was important. It, it was important. I had this conversation the other day. People just don't write letters anymore. In fact, my wife and I found an app that write the letters for us. That's how lazy we are. I'll admit it. It looks like my handwriting. It's my words. But someone else did it. <laughs> Sorry, babe. I'll let your secret out of the bag. Paul was halfway across the world writing these letters. Paul was building community. Even though he was in jail, even though he was in Greece, he was writing to churches near Turkey. You build community. The church does not build community for you to just plug into. You have to build your community. You're the one who decides who comes to your house, if anyone comes at all. You're the one who decides, are we going to be people that experience our neighborhood, or do we just come here, sleep, eat, and do everything inside of our house, and it looks like nobody lives there because our drapes are always closed. We don't go outside. We don't want to know who's next door, and we're just going to complain. Because I get letters from those people. My, I got so many letters about illegal fireworks this year as a city councilman. So many letters. And then when I asked, would you go next door and talk to them? Oh, no. 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 Again, we want others to do the job that we are capable of doing ourselves. I don't want to build community in my church. That's the pastor's job. Right. 
I, I, don't, I don't mind. I don't mind. But I don't really know what it is you're, you need. I don't really know what it is you need. You could come hang out in my community. It's just the problem is, is my community is full with a swimming pool of kids under the age of seven. Some of you don't want that kind of community. Naked babies running around screaming all the time. That's normal. I'm okay with that. Some of you would be like, oh, my goodness, I got to leave. We're living from a place where I believe this, where I believe the Lord is wanting to instill in us hearts of mothers and fathers. And I've actually taught this to teenagers. Now, I'm not saying that teenagers are ready to have babies, but I am saying that they are prepared enough to begin to cultivate the heart of a mother and the heart of a father. That's why I am able to grieve after what I saw transpire throughout our nation this past week. Because the heart of a father is what was touched more so than the heart of an American. I, I, did you catch that? Because it was the heart of a father and a mother that grieves more than the heart of an American. The greatest thing I will ever do in my life is not be an American. I'm as patriotic as the next person, but the greatest thing I will ever do in my life is father the children that I've been blessed with. Malachi chapter 4. The Bible says this, look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives, and his preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. As a church, as, as, a, as an emerging church, this scripture has been trumpeted since the, the early 90s, the mid-90s, by several prayer movements, by several quote-unquote revival movements, that the hearts of the fathers are turning to the children, the hearts of the children are returning to the fathers, and then we, we kind of just cut it off there, and we forget the otherwise, I will come and strike the land. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 15 through 16. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father, for I become your father in Christ Jesus when I preach the good news to you. And then in verse 16, Paul says, so I urge you to be like me. I, uh, I coach at Reedley College. I, I coach the men's basketball team there. I'm the, I'm the assistant, head assistant coach. And we, we do this, uh, Coach Jennings and I, we, we agree that it's bigger than basketball. It's bigger, it has to be bigger than basketball because a lot of these young men are coming in with NBA dreams, but, but they got rec league practice habits. More importantly, we want them to leave our program and our school ready for life, ready to be men. Regardless of where they've come from, we want them prepared to accomplish the things that they've set themselves out to accomplish. And so the question I had to ask our head coach was, are you ready to let boys, young men, imitate you? Because ultimately, that's what's going to change their life. You can stand in front of someone and preach at them until you're blue in the face, but all they're going to do is look at your life. People will forget what you've, what you've told them. People will forget what letters you've written them, because I don't know how long you're supposed to save them anyways. But here's what people will not forget, how you treated them. How you acted around them. Did you look at them in the eyes? Did you treat them as intimately as a brother or a sister deserved to be treated? That's what they remember. And so I told TJ, I was like, listen, these young men are going to come in here. We're going to teach all these, you know, great athletic cliches. But are we going to ask them be like us? Because ultimately, as a father and a mother, that's what you're doing. You're saying, be like me. Be like me. And a lot of times, I'll get kids dropped off at my youth group from parents that say, I don't want my kid to be like me, so you change them. I'm like, what? That, that's, that's not how it works. 
I don't want people to be like me. So you build the community that I want to be like so I can come and plug myself in and then leave when I feel like I've gotten charged up. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. I wish it kind of did. We need people who have hearts of mothers and fathers, and more importantly, who aren't afraid to look at somebody in the eye and say, you know what, you could be like me. I'm not perfect. But if you imitate me, we'll get somewhere together. That's tough. That's why I love Paul, because he wasn't afraid to say that. That's a man confident in where he is with the Lord. I just kind of want to throw some numbers at you. Can we do that? So uh, earlier, Lance introduced uh, my boy Shane. And Shane and I, we talk about this often, but for, for a while now, the emerging church has been talking about a billion soul harvest. How many have heard about a billion soul harvest? Is anyone aware? Okay, good. Six of you. Perfect. It's been prophesied now for probably the last decade that, that we are on the cuffs of a billion soul harvest. Can I just drop some numbers on you really quick? Half of the world's population is under the age of 25. Approximately 6 billion people populate the earth today. Half of them are under the age of 25. So that's 3 billion people are under the age of 25. It's scientifically known that your brain is not even fully developed until the age of 24. So half of the world is populated by young men and women who haven't even fully developed their bodies yet. We tracking? 1.2 billion are between the ages of 10 and 19. 10 years old, 19 years, teenagers. Teenagers, 1.2 billion people on the earth are teenagers. It's kind of scary, right? Is that kind of scary anyway? They're tweeting, they're Snapchatting, they're hashtagging. Don, do you know what a hashtag is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> ah! Come on, Don. 308 million live in the United States of America. 25% are under the age of 20. That's 77 million people in the United States of America under the age of 20 are teenagers. So billion, what does this billion soul harvest look like? Let's just, let's just kind of, I just kind of want to run the numbers. At, at a ratio of discipleship, I think that we can, I think you are capable of discipling Five people. I mean, really doing life with, with, I think, five. I think that's a good number. We're just going to say five. That you are capable of influencing five people. I mean, really influencing people in your life. I'm going to say five. It might be less. Some of you think it could be more. I think if you're really going to do great discipleship work, I think five's a good number. So we're just going to carry that into this. At a ratio of one to five people, the five are the ones being discipled, the one is you. If this billion soul harvest is to happen, it would require 200 million believers to walk with five new believers and disciple. In other words, tomorrow, if tomorrow a billion people got saved, tomorrow, we would need 200 million Christians to stand up and say, I'll disciple five. Now, some of you are like, well, I'm not in a position to do that, Pastor Charles, so I'm out. Right? I'm out. Okay. Then who's in? Because <laughs> we're going to need 200 million. Let me, I'll break it down to Madeira. How about that? So based on 15% of the billion soul harvest and, and, and that prophecy, if, if it were to happen, assuming with the population of where it's at in the city of Madeira, it would require 2,100 believers to walk with the five new believers here in the city of Madeira. Now, that number is not so high. All we would need are a little over 2,000 men and women who fear the Lord, who are seeking after Jesus with all of their heart, to say, I'll take on five. The problem is, is when we go to the Church of Madeira events, there's like 150 people there, not 2,000. 
So it's easy for us to sit here and nod our head and say, yeah, yeah, a billion soul harvest. Let's get them saved. That's what the world needs. The world needs Jesus. Too much is happening. But then we just get a reprise of the Jesus movement in the 70s. When men and women were coming into churches barefoot, long hair, tie-dyed shirts, sometimes no shirts, and the church go, well, where's your tie, sir? Where are your shoes, sir? I said, I don't know. Some guy just prayed for me in the street. I gave my heart to Jesus, and this is the first church I saw. You guys following me? Because in the Jesus movement, more people were turned away than were actually brought into the church. That's why we have so many people that are hurt by church. That are in their 60s, late 50s and their 60s. And they raised 30-year-olds who are now having babies who are hurt by church because their mother or father were turned away from a church when they got saved in the Jesus movement of the 70s. And that's just new believers. We would, need, we would need one for five. That's just new believers. That's not counting some of you in here who really need community, who are like, uh, can I sign up to be one of those five? I don't want to sign up to be the one. I want to sign up to be one of the five. Fathers and mothers have a natural understanding that their legacy is in people that they actually pour into. My legacy isn't on how many sermons I have archived on our on our website. My legacy isn't on how many times I run for office and get elected. My legacy is instilled into the heart of Roger Edison Rigby and Chase and David Rigby. That is my legacy for now. Success in our culture is, is measured by so many weird things, specifically performance. Would you agree? Success in today's culture it's measured by performance. They don't want to know how you got there. Just show me what you got. Right? Kids don't want to learn. When I used to sit down and do homework with my dad, he wouldn't just give me the answer, and it made me very mad. He would show me where it's at in the book and then make me read the paragraphs. Of the I was like, Dad, no. Just what's the answer? Because that's what we want. We go onto our Internet and we www. We just want the answer. Give me the answer. I just want the answer. Who is this person? I don't know. Oh, this is who they are. I know them very well. Wiki tells me. The church is called to build people, not buildings. The church is called to build people. And then the people that are built by the church, they go out and they build the community. And then the community that they built is the legacy. The church isn't the building. The church is you. If we come together and we begin to encourage each other and build each other, then we can go out and we can begin to build community. You start your neighborhood watch. As you start your neighborhood watch group, you come into contact with other people that have similar interests. You got kids, I got kids. Your kids love bicycling, I love by what? We should do something together. They say, how about Sunday at 10? You say, I can't, I go to church. You what? Fathers and mothers share their lives. It's about opening your life. That's what fathers and mothers do. They, they just, they just, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, 11, and 12. Paul writes, we loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. Over the course of this week, as I'm watching the hashtags and the Facebook Christians and they're telling me that, man, you want to fix what happened in Dallas? We need the gospel. I agree 1,000%. And I, I stand by every evangelist that says we just need the gospel. Just give them the gospel. But there has to be something that comes with the gospel. Because even Paul understood, look, we'll give you the gospel, but we're also going to give you our lives. It's one thing to preach the gospel, but then I give you my life to go with it. It's like a spoon to eat the ice cream. You can eat that. You'll figure out a way to eat the ice cream. But if I give you a spoon, it's a little easier, isn't it? So I can give you the gospel. It's sweet. It's delicious. It's good. You'll find a way to eat it. 
But if I give you a spoon, ah, this is a little easier. I give you my life. This is why building a culture that challenges you to grow is so important. Your life becoming whole is critical because when it's all said and done, the only thing you actually have to give this earth is your life. That's why it's so critical that, that you have to get whole. You have to get whole. More importantly, you need people in your lives to help with that process. It's so important that you are a part of community that helps you grow. Otherwise, you just don't grow and you're a part of a bunch of people that are happy and, and stagnant and stale and I'm not growing. I love the challenge of people. That's why I love it. People just challenge me. They challenge you to grow. That's, that's why I love this, this book. Anybody read this book before? Come on. Come on, teachers in the house. My mama was a teacher. And I remember this book growing up. And then one day I was, I was shopping, and I just saw it. And I, I just I grabbed it, and I just started reading it. And I felt like a little kid again. And it's a story, The Giving Tree. I want to give it all away because maybe some of your kids will want to read it. But it's about a boy who grows up coming to this tree. And this tree would just constantly give of whatever it had. Until the boy became of a certain age where the tree couldn't give anymore. But the tree still found a way to serve the little boy's life, who was then a man. The boy found a girlfriend, got married, said, I want to build a house. So the tree said, well, I don't have any wood, but you can, you can cut down my, my trunk to make lumber. And then all that was left of this tree was a stump. The boy literally had taken everything this tree had, from, from fruit to leaves, everything this tree had had, everything. Absolutely everything. There was nothing left of this tree but a little stump. And then the boy shows up, and, it, and, and he's older. And the tree says, well, you can't climb me anymore because I don't have a, a trunk. And you can't eat my apples because I don't have any more apples. And you can't sit under the shade of my leaf because I don't have any more. All these things that the boy couldn't do. And the boy said, well, that's fine. I don't, I don't feel like doing any of those things. He's like, I'm old and tired. I just want to sit. And the tree said, well, I can, I can do that. I was, I'm a stump. Sit on my stump. And so the boy, the man, sat on the stump. And then the, the, it says here, and the tree was happy. The tree was happy. We need a fresh vision of growth. We need to instill the hearts of mothers and fathers in a generation. You need to begin to cultivate the heart of a mother and a father. Ian Bounds said, preaching is not the performance of an hour. It is the outflow of a life. It takes 20 years to make a sermon because it takes 20 years to make a man. Preaching is not a performance of an hour. I, preaching is not what I'm doing right now. Preaching is how I'm living. Preaching is not when I'm on a microphone archiving a message, going through the word of God. Show me in the word, brother. I'm just going to go ahead and show you with my life, but I'll also show you in the word. This is why it's so valuable that we're taking the time to find a children's pastor right now. This is why we need mothers and fathers to volunteer in the nursery right now. And when I say mothers and fathers, I don't mean those of you who have born child. I'm talking about those of you that have a heart of a mother and a father. That if you're really tired of what is taking place in our nation today, then we can't let another generation go fatherless and motherless. It's not the sermon that makes the man, it's the life. It's not the sermon that makes the woman, it's the life. And that needs to be developed. That's why we have to allow the Lord to develop our lives because at the end of the day, that's what we have to give people. It's our life. It's our life. I don't have any more apples. I don't have any more, I don't have any leaves. I don't have anything. All I got is this stump. It's good enough for me. I don't have any answers for you. I don't have any extra money to send you to sports camp. I don't have any, I don't know what you, I just have my life. You can come do life with me. 
And so at the age of 17, I take in a girl who my wife didn't birth. But Ruby's like a daughter to me. And I'm not going to let her go through life fatherless. So come live with me. Come do life with me. And I'll never forget, my mom said, are you sure that's what you sure you want this teenage girl moving in with you? And I said, mom, if there's anything that I want this teenage girl to learn, it's what it is for a man to prefer a woman as a husband to a wife and a wife to prefer a man as a woman to a husband. Just come do life. I could have gone to lunch over and over and over and over and over again with Ruby. And we would have had a great relationship. She would be doing phenomenal whether or not. But the fact is something inside of me said, bring this one in. Do life. Okay, let's do life. My life on her life. Our life, my family's life on her life. And then I'm watching as God begins to heal her family's life. Come on. Life has to be intentional. If your life is going to change someone else's life, it has to be intentional. But then the other thing that I've learned now through parenting is it has to be inconvenient. The greatest inconvenience in life, parenting. And some of you are giggling. Because you think I should be up here saying the greatest reward in life is parenting. It is. But if you want the great reward, you have to put in some sacrifice. That NBA championship trophy is probably pretty expensive. But you ask Michael Jordan how much it costs. He said it's priceless. It's priceless. I worked way too hard for this. It's priceless. It's priceless. That's why you see the Golden State Warriors doing what they're doing. They, it's priceless. I want one. I'm not saying parenting isn't a great reward. I'm just saying it's inconvenient. It, it just is. And that's okay. Because I choose to accept the inconvenience in order to get what comes of it. Church could be an inconvenient to you, but are you willing to choose the inconvenience in order to get what comes out of it? Volunteering in the nursery might be an inconvenience to you. Are you willing to do it in order to get what comes out of it? Are we willing to instill the hearts of mothers and fathers into a generation while we begin to continually nurture ours? This is a kingdom principle, family. This is inheritance. You, we... We are not trying to raise a church of great volunteers. We're trying to raise mothers and fathers that understand when it's time to fight, when it's time to love, when it's time to counsel, when it's time to worship, when it's time to wail, and when it's time to dance. Because that's what we're living in. Life on life has to be intentional. It has to be inconvenient. The reason I know this is because Jesus made following him completely inconvenient. Matthew 16, 24. If any of you want to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, then you'll save it. Anybody out here not live selfishly? Luke chapter 9, verse 57. <clears throat> As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And then Jesus said, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man have no place to lay his head. I'll go with you wherever you go, Jesus. Cool, I don't have nowhere to sleep tonight. Oh, never mind. You sure you're not going to Marriott, Jesus? Nope. He said to another person, come and follow me. And the man agreed. But he said, Lord, first I must go home and bury my father. And Jesus told him, let the spiritual dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. I got to go bury someone, Jesus. Give me, give me one day and I'll follow you. No, following me is inconvenient. But that's okay. Because it was the inconvenience that built the community, and it was the community that actually built the church. 
It was the community of the discipleships that the church was built out of. It wasn't the church then built the community. Peter came out of the community of being with the disciples. And then Jesus said, you get to do, build the church. See, we've got it all the way twisted. We want the church to build the community, and then out of the community, I'm saying we've got to build the community so we can build the church. I'm also saying that it might be a little inconvenient sometimes. But the inconvenience of getting up and holding my son at 6 in the, in the morning after holding him all night at 3 and then again at midnight and then again. Yeah. I love when I get to just smell his hair. You know what I'm talking about? You go, you just smell that baby hair. And I say, I wonder what you're going to do. I wonder, I wonder what is Jason David going to do? And then I just begin to rock and pray, intercede and weep. And then I fall asleep. It's inconvenient. It's inconvenient. It's inconvenient when I get a phone call. I got a flat tire. I go, oh, Ruby, all right. It's inconvenient. I'm sure I was a huge inconvenience. I'm sure you were too. But wasn't it worth it? We cannot let a generation slip through our fingers yet again, church. As you are praying, we need leadership and direction in some of our areas of children's ministry. But I'll tell you what, we shouldn't have to look as far as we're looking. Somebody in this, in this room's heart needs to burn. And when they see what they're seeing on the news stations, they're affected not because it's America. They're affected because that's somebody's child. That's somebody's husband. That's somebody's wife. Somebody's family. As we continue to pray for the hearts of the fathers to turn to the children and the hearts of the children to turn to the fathers, let's begin, church, Let's begin to take personal responsibility for our lives and not let someone else walk out our Christianity. Let's stand. Comparison is what kills destiny. If the Lord is stirring in your heart this morning, man, I have got to begin to cultivate this heart of a mother, this heart of a father. Maybe there's three people that the Lord has put in your life and has been kind of egging you on. You need to invite these people to your house. You need to begin to do life with them. You need to let them into your life. It needs to feel inconvenient. I want to encourage you this morning, do it. Make the phone call. Make the text message. Go knock on someone. Write the letter. Whatever it looks like. Put yourself in an inconvenient place to where you would begin to see lives changed because of it. The greatest legacy that you're going to leave this earth isn't in a bank account and isn't written in some books. It is your life. Jesus, we pray this morning that the church would answer the call to begin to cultivate hearts of mothers and fathers, that we would begin to see a generation that is loved for, that is cared for, that is taught the word of God, and that is given every opportunity to encounter your son, Jesus. Father, I pray this morning that you would release courage and boldness to those that need discipleship, that they would ask to be discipled. For those that need to disciple others, that they would be pushed out of their comfort zone into a place that feels inconvenient, but is understandably knowing that you are investing in generations and you are actually participating in the kingdom principle of inheritance, that you are given freely what has been given to you. Father, I pray that we would be a house that is built on legacy, that is built on inheritance, and that is filled with mothers and fathers who are ready and willing to volunteer when it's time, who are ready and willing to receive and accept the call of heaven upon their lives. 
that our men's ministry would be filled with volunteers of fathers and mothers, that our women's ministry would be filled with volunteers of mothers and fathers, that our children and youth ministries would be filled with volunteers of men and women who cultivate a mother and father's heart. Father, as you begin to heal our nation, would you return the hearts of fathers to children and children to fathers, God, that we would answer the call that is within our hearts, not comparing ourselves to what other Christians are or are not doing, but that we would answer the call that you are giving to us, that we would live in obedience, fearful of you, O oh Lord, and understanding that it's through prayer that we receive our strength to do all things to the glory of the kingdom. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you guys. We'll see you here next Sunday.